Hello and welcome to Know Before You Go. I'm Father Scott Steinkirchner, the technology guy for the province, and we have wonderful readings today, all of a piece. So I want to walk you through them one at a time, because they build on each other. The first reading is from the prophet Isaiah, and he says in part, Foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, I will bring to my holy mountain and make joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Why does Isaiah even need to say that? Well, because the temple and its sacrifices were for Jews only. Uh, Non-Jews couldn't go into the temple to offer sacrifices. Remember, at the beginning of time, God makes everyone in the image of God. But then, at a point, God chooses to choose over all peoples of the world to be his own people. And he gives them the law. And he has them build the temple, and he gives them Jerusalem as a place to worship him. And so, temple worship and following the law, it's only for Jews. And they go from disobedience to obedience by being obedient to the law. But the rest of humanity we call the Gentiles, they can't be obedient to God because they don't even have the law. So, the second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. And he's got this confusing sentence in there. Just as you, he's talking to Gentile Christians, just as you once disobeyed God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, the Jews. So they have now disobeyed in order that by virtue of the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. Paul's argument is this. The Jews went from disobedience to obedience in God's will by following the law that they were given. Gentiles were always disobedient because they didn't have the law. They didn't know it. They couldn't be obedient. Well, then Jesus comes along the fulfillment of the law and Paul starts preaching to the Jews about Jesus but mostly they didn't believe in him. By and large, then they became disbelievers. Not all of them, of course, we have Paul and the apostles, but Paul is so discouraged by how he does with Jews that he goes to the Gentiles and starts to preach about Jesus, and they believe him. They come into obedience by droves. And so he makes this argument, look, God used the Jews and made them disobedient, hardened their hearts to open up a place so that you who were disobedient could become obedient. It's only because they turned me away, wouldn't listen, that I even came to you so that you could become believers. So he says, God's not going to abandoned them there, he's faithful to his promise. One day, they'll come into obedience, believing in Jesus. And that day, wow, imagine if their disobedience <laughs> led to such great things for you. Imagine what their obedience will mean for you. So one day, one day, he says, when? Well, when everyone who's coming ashore comes ashore. <laughs> when all the Gentiles believe who are going to believe. No hurry. Still more people coming in today. 
seems like it's the end of time when this will happen. But God is patient. And so that's the context then for this very strange and somewhat troubling gospel. Jesus is traveling in Gentile territory, uh, Tyre and Sidon. And this Gentile woman he calls a Canaanite woman. Canaanites are the people who lived in the land before the Jews came. This Canaanite woman comes up, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. Heal him. And Jesus ignores her. His disciples say, send her away. She's so noisy. And Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman keeps it up and says to him, does him homage, does Jesus homage? Remember the first reading. He says, Lord, help me. So he said, it is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. And she said, please, Lord, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table at their masters. <laughs> then Jesus said to her in reply, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And the woman's daughter was healed from that moment. Her persistence is amazing. Jesus' words seem a little harsh, but they allow her to show how much she won't be turned away. She believes in him and demands this healing from him. What are we to make of this? Well, first in the broad scheme of things, there's Christians and then there's everybody else, right? And we think we Christians who come to believe in Jesus, that we're so much better than everyone else. But, you know, the Jews are still God's chosen people. And one day God will bring us all together. God's playing this long game, willing to wait till the end of time. So these different religions of the world, they can persist for a while. God will work it out at the end of time. And let these differences persist for now. In the same way, all of these divisions that we make between people about who's worthy of God's grace and who's not, or who's worthy of my help and who's not. They might be true for a moment, but eventually they just all have to fall away. God is the God of the whole world and wants to save everyone and has a plan that in the end, he'll gather them all up. So the limits we put on our grace, the limits we put on our generosity, ultimately they have to fall. There can't be limits. Like the woman who wears Jesus down. <laughs> and this is then the third piece of that. Jesus' words seem harsh. And it seems like he's just convinced and changes because of this woman. But the fathers of the church couldn't believe Jesus would be so harsh. So they said, you know, he knew everything. So he knew that she had the faith to keep at it. So in a sense, he's playing her along for her to show her faith so that he can use it as an example to his disciples. It is a beautiful thought. Hmm, do with it what you want. But also there's the idea that she is convincing him that he is changing his mind at the moment. Because he says, wasn't I sent just for the lost sheep of Israel? And then at the end, no, for you as well, I'll do this miracle. And some of the fathers of the church said, well, he couldn't have changed his mind because he can't sin. He's Jesus. But is changing our mind 
we're seeing a broader picture. Does that mean we were sinning before? Or we just didn't see as big? See, sometimes we get so stuck in our positions that we say, well, I can't change it because then I'd have to admit that I was wrong. Well, maybe you weren't even wrong before, but it would be wrong now to hold that same position because the world changes and God's plan and God's truth gradually unfolds. So just repeating what was true before in the future isn't always holding to the truth. Sometimes it's just stubborn to hold to the truth. Sometimes we need to grow and change to keep up with God's plan for the world. So that's no before you go for the 20th weekend of ordinary time. God bless you.